Hey, this is Brent Jensen, and you're listening to No Sleep Till Sudbury, the show where we talk about the music that makes your skin vibrate. This show is brought to you by Pariah Pickups. What you want, what you need, and what you love. From all the way down in Detroit City, check them out at pariahpickups.com. And to support the No Sleep Till Sudbury show on Patreon, visit patreon.com slash Brent Jensen Music. I'm joined this week by singer-songwriter Nelson Sobral. He told me to say it like that. Sobral. You have to roll the R. I'm doing my best. He just released his excellent new record. It's called Second Arrow. The single is called Dance and Fool, and it's good. Here he is to talk about it. Nelson Sobral, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the show. How are you, man? I'm excellent. Thanks for having me back, Brent. I am pleased to do so. As you know, I am a fan. It has been uh, a little while since we chatted last, but you have a new record mm-hmm. available. I have a new record. I have a new baby. I have a new, 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 new with the new. I don't know. Just, this all stupid. You're a new man. That's awesome. I'm a new man. You are. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I got a new record and a new baby, and, I'm, and life is great. And yeah, I can't really complain. I have a new record called Second Arrow. Mm-hmm. And a new baby called Rain. His name is Rain, R E I G N. Nice. Yeah. I've yeah. seen pictures. Very cute. Yeah. He's, he is really cute. Like, I know it's not, you know, cool to say that about your own baby, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> why not? He's freaking cute, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't look at him. I'm like, man, you're cute. He doesn't look like me. He looks like, a, like, a, like his mama, like my beautiful wife. Yeah. So I'm, I'm blessed that way. So I, I can, it's like, if he looked like me and I was saying he's cute, I could understand him doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't he looks like my wife so i'm like yeah he's super cute there you wife. go you're entitled and he gets away with I, I can already foresee like it's gonna be trouble some you know trying to you know um what's the word i'm looking for he's gonna he's gonna play you against your mom and oh vice yeah versa. yeah and he's gonna be so cute doing it to yeah. discipline him sorry that's the word i was looking for it's gonna be hard to discipline him because he's got a really cute smile gets me right in the gut Char- <laughs> a little charmer so, oh yeah <laughs> yeah so the yeah the new era, uh the new album came out a few weeks ago um i'm glad to have it finally out it's uh i've been meaning to put it out for a little while but like the baby happened and then i was trying to you know not that he was like stopping me from putting out the album but it was just like i was kind of just navigating making sure everything was okay and it was mm-hmm. just like you know life stuff and yeah. and but I, I did want to put it out last year and then it was getting near the end of the year and the holidays were coming up and I was like, okay, okay, I'll just do it right at the beginning of next year. So that's what I did. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's out. Now, it's, it, great. It, it, it's been, it's been two years since you've been releasing singles from yes. Second Arrow. It's finally out, which is great. And, and mm-hmm. I've heard it. I love it. Um, I'd heard Thank a little you. bit of it previously and uh, like middle of the night is on there. And yes, it's, it's such a killer too. That That's going to be a big Thank hit you. for you, man. Like it really is. Thanks man. That's one of my favorites too. I, you know, those are that's one of the ones that when you're writing, you're like, oh yeah, this is great. Oh, it and just... it's like you're you're unabashedly able to say that, even though it's your own tune. Like, oh, I dig, I dig singing this chorus. I love this riff. This yeah. is great. Yeah. yeah, it's super catchy. It's a hit. Thanks. Thank you. Now, the title of the record, Second Arrow. I understand there's a cryptic message behind that title. Is that right? Yeah, maybe not so cryptic, but yeah, I mean, kind of in a way, like. Um, it's a like there's a whole, whole parable, whole story that goes along with it. It's a Buddhist parable mm. of how uh, you know someone was complaining to Buddha about something, and uh, Buddha told this person that you know they, they they asked him like when this person caused you harm, that was the first arrow that they shot into you, right? That caused you harm with this person, you know, insult or attack on your character or whatever it was. And the person's like, yeah, yeah, and blah blah blah, and, they, and, and the person keeps talking about it and talking about it, and Buddha says. Now you've inflicted the second arrow because you keep bringing it up. You keep repeating it over and over in your head. Oh. So essentially shooting another arrow into the same wound. Oh, by dwelling on yeah. it. Yeah. Dwelling on it, going over it in your head, like reliving it, reliving the pain, reliving, you know, all the trauma that goes along with it. Like, you know, your brain doesn't know the difference between it being real or not. You know, your body reacts the same way to, to trauma. You know? Right, right, yeah whether it's imagined or real, you know, your brain is just like, Oh yeah, this is not good. And your body will react chemically the same way. So yeah, it was just Buddha's way of saying, uh, like, you know, don't try not to react to it again. Like try to let, try to observe it and let it pass and mm. not inflict that, that second arrow. Like, yeah, this bad thing happened. Absolutely. It's horrible not to take away the, the, the heaviness of that. 
Yeah. But just, you know, you got to move past it at some point. Like, what are you going to do? You're just going to dwell on it. You're going to keep shooting arrows into the same wound. Like it's never going to heal. There has to be a point where you let it go. Yeah. This is reflective of some stuff that you've personally been through. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. Like, like all of us have been through that in life, like deaths and loss of friendships and whatever hardships come your way. Like that is one part of it. I mean, with this pedal, I felt like I was letting go of a lot of things that didn't serve me, um, you know, uh, getting on with my life, you know, moving on with my wife and stuff and, and creating a life together was one. And then at the same, the same time, um, before I started putting out singles, I was down in Nashville staying with a friend mm -hmm. and I actually was with him, uh, you know, in our, in our kitchen, hanging out, well, his kitchen. And I wrote two of the songs that are on the album, uh, In the Middle of the Night and Raining in Nashville. There with him in the kitchen, we, we were like, you know, we'd go to open mics at night and then during the day we'd hang out and, and work on tunes and stuff and mm -hmm. just, you know, enjoy each other's company and go traveling around Nashville. And, and then when the pandemic started, you know how they were telling everyone to go back to your countries and stay, you know, to go back and quarantine in your home, home country and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he reached out to me and he was like, you know, can I come back with you? And I was like, absolutely, you know. I had, had enough space and I had, you know, just, they were asking that you have a separate entrance, that you bring food to them, you know what I mean? Like while they quarantine and you know, all that, you know, all you know, stuff that seems like it was, a, it's a million years, you know, away, but you know, this was like two years ago. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so he was supposed to come stay with us, with me and my wife. And uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately he decided that wasn't what he wanted to do. And uh, yeah, and he kind of took his own life. Uh. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible. It sucks. Um, dear friend. And he was unfortunately the kind of person that would continually bring up depressing stuff and stuff that, you know, wasn't going right in his life. And, you know, I mean, we all do it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not sitting here like a same thing. I never complain. I complain all the time. Right. We all do it, but there has to be a point where like, yeah, yeah. Okay. It sucks. It's horrible. Okay. But now let's move on from it and and some people can do that and some people unfortunately can't you know mm -hmm. sometimes and it gets too heavy and you're stuck in that you know you two have a song called uh, stuck in a moment you can't get out of yep yeah and i you know unfortunately that happens to people sometimes and you know especially if you're by yourself and you have no one with you to help you you know deliver you out of the darkness and into the light um, mm -hmm. you know or make it to the next morning you know sometimes it gets the better of you kind of is what happens so it's kind of a testament to him and and like a reminder to to myself and everything to not shoot that second arrow. Yeah. You know, yeah. you've already been inflicted with that pain. You need to you know, deal with that wound and move on. I'm sorry, man. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to make it a heavy one, but no. that's what happened. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I want to tell you something about um, the single. So the single is "Dancing Fool" and it kicks off the record. Mm. And mm. I, I'm going to tell you something. When I listen to that song. I'm consistently reminded of John Cougar Mellencamp. Oh, cool. So here, here's the thing. Like, I, I've been trying to figure this out, right? Because I listen to your record. Your voice does not sound like his at all. I love your voice. Mm -hmm. I love his, but they're completely different. You do not sound like him in instrumentation at all. It's because you deliver the music with the same type of rootsy warmth and familiarity that he does, I think. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's a special thing, man. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think if we if we if we hung out, me and John Crew might have a lot of the same record collection. I'm sure. <laughs> so yeah, that'll absolutely. probably, yeah. You know, like you know, growing up on you know, for lack of a better word, traditional, you know, roots music. You know, being it '50s doo wop or you know, like uh, old blues. Like you know, at different points in my life, I was very heavy into like you know, I was a, I was a, for sure when I was 16. You know, you couldn't talk me out of the fact that I was a blues man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know. <laughs> I was reincarnated as a blues man. And it's all I listened to. It's all I played. It's all I researched. You know, I, I went heavy into that stuff. And I was like, I know all about Robert Johnson. I know all about Lightning Hopkins. I know about these guys. You know, I know about the Three Kings and Muddy Waters and Helen Wolf. You know, that delivery and, you know, that the way they would sing, it, it just, it always, and, and soul singers. Like, I'm a big soul music fan. Oh, yeah. My mama raised me on, on soul music. And the delivery is always, for lack of a better word, there's no bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and I don't mind, you know, a little prettiness in the vocal and, and the delivery. I feel like with like, even like Aretha is like, she hit, it's like every, every, every song. It's like, you feel it's the truth. Even if you know, like, that's not a real story. It feels like she's telling you the truth. That's right. And that it's, it's your truth or it's someone else's truth. It's truth for somebody. 
and it just feels real. Even if like when Otis is singing like uh, silly lyrics like "Fa Fa Fa," the sad song, he's got a song that's titled that, and it's it just looks ridiculous. Yeah, and he sings it in the chorus like "Fa Fa 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 Fa." Your turn. It's like campy and thing, but it's like <laughs> it's just it, it doesn't feel like bullshit to me when he sings it. I just feel it every time. Yeah. And yeah, it's just in the delivery. I can't get away from singing like that. You know, as much as I appreciate you know, cool singers. And I wish I could sing pretty. I wish I could sing harmonies. I, like I, I play in a couple of bands and like, you know, I try to do good harmonies and, and stuff, but I always, I'm always like soul singing and, and moving it different and vibratoing it different than, than a good harmonizing singer would do. So, you know, it's a pro and a con in that sense. But I think the thing that me and John, John Mellencamp, John Cougar Mellencamp uh, have in common, you know, is uh, the delivery is, is just, these are the words. This is the emotion. I'm just going to tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. I woke up this morning. This is what happened. Boom. Yeah. 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 And, and you, you have to feel it. Yeah. That's it. There's no other thing to it. And I dig him a lot. You know, growing up, I, he's, he was great. Like I never got really into John Cougar, but I, you know, I know all the songs, you know, when I hear them, I'm like, oh yeah, there's such great songs. I heard so good. And Jack and Diane, and the wall comes tumbling down. Such good tracks. I got and great hair too. <laughs> Don't great hair that. dude. Don't forget yeah, that. Yeah, man. The, you know, uh, the rock and mullet. Oh yeah. A lot of what John Cougar is musically is um just kind of what he stands for and what he represents. You know, even mm -hmm. if you don't like the music, you have to respect him. Cuz like you said, you know, you, you you believe him. He's not full of shit. I do. Right. Yeah. And he came out I believe it, him. It's interesting cuz he came out at an interesting time. You know, a lot of the 80s music was and you know it was it was fun but it was full of shit what a weird decade right what a weird decade for music cool that you could hear john cougar and you could hear thompson twins and yeah you know but I, I do think that the two of you draw inspiration from the same sources for sure mm -hmm. like another guy that that kind of does it and he is the you know you know i don't want to say he's full of shit but he's he's the, he's in my opinion the best character singer personality of all time which is mick jagger mm. um like, you know, you know, he's a sweet, like, you know, British guy. Like, he's not a street fighting man, but you believe him when he sings that. Yeah. Like, a street fighting man. Like, you, you're, <laughs> you feel that. Like, oh, yeah. He inhibits that character, and he is that person 100%. Oh, like, yeah. And he feels it, and it's in his delivery, you know. Like, he's making you believe it because it's coming from, regardless of the lyrics, it's connecting to a, a, a deep point in him, in his being. That's right. Sometimes the lyrics don't even matter for, you know, for that. You can just say like, Ooh, yeah, and, you know, and you feel it. He delighted in, in singing in a, you know, a black voice, you know, as it were. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of um, course. He was very proud of the fact that he could do that. And, and he, he even adopted a country draw for, you know, things like honky tonk women and some of the stuff. Far away eyes. Let it bleed. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Great character, great character, and, and a very underrated lyricist, especially oh, in the yeah. Yeah. late 60s, early 70s, man. Wow, he wrote some crushing, crushing. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of, this is a great segue into your first oh, cool. tune from your list, mm -hmm. Rolling Stones. Let's kick it off. You've got Rocks yeah. Off. Now, this is, uh, what a way to kick off any list, man, Rocks Off. It's the first song from Exile on Main Street. Absolutely. Just, you know, one of the greatest rock and roll double albums of the time. You know, I remember being a kid and discovering that and like, it kind of scared me at, at <laughs> what was on there, like all the different things that were on there and uh, excited me. And, you know, that's what a, you know, a real rock and roll record should do. It should delight and excite you and kind of a little bit of fear, yeah. you know, it's like, oh, what is this? Yeah. And it just opens up in the most like rough and tumble, rebellious attitude riff and you know, the whole band is just like, they all kind of like stumble into the song, like, da 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 dun dun da boom ba. They're all kind of like, it sounds like they're all kind of drunk and bumping into each That's other. Right. Yeah. And Mick is just like, oh, yeah. And it's, just, <laughs> it's like, you can't get more stonesy than that intro of that song. Totally. And that song has one of my favorite lyrics of all time in music. And it's, it's like the last verse after the bridge, mm -hmm. that weird little psychedelic bridge. And he comes back in and he says, the sunshine bores the daylights out of me. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's such poetry. The sunshine bores the daylights out of me. Yeah. Oh, him, and, him and Keith sing oh. that together, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, in my opinion, one of the greatest harmony singers of all time. Oh. Keith Richards. On this record, man. You listen to him do Love and Cup. Oh, so good. It's like, so, so great, good. Right? And and this the whole album is is like Jagger's at the height of his lyric writing power. Like some of them make sense, some of them don't make sense, but they're like falling around each other. These lyrics, he's making them rhyme with his with the way he twists his words. Oh yeah. And they're just so colorful and, and like there's the imagery there is incredible. Like he's just he's dropping all these little nuggets everywhere. Man, I, I just I think he's so underrated in the grand scheme of things as a lyricist, and it's a shame. Agreed. Because like yeah, he's he's one of the greats. I mean, he may have lost it a little bit, but I mean, come on, look at the career of those those guys. Have seen. Oh. It's easier to rip on a band that's been around for fifty years. Of course, they're gonna make some mistakes. Same thing with like a band like you too. Like people rip on them all the time, but it's like, man, those guys they've been, they've had like three arcs in their career. Exactly. You try that. Exactly. Yeah. Well, try they, try one. You try know. one arc. Try one hit. You yeah. know, these guys have had multitudes and. Of course, they're gonna make some bad moves. Everyone does. Oh yeah, when you when you have a career that's that long, there's gonna be a couple of clunkers. Yeah, <laughs> you know, man, we've all done it. We've all made mistakes. It's just they're in the spotlight, so they get the light shot on them. And I, I remember Einstein did this. Uh, he did this math problem where he wrote out it was like this uh, a bunch of equations, mm -hmm. and then the last one he he wrote the answer incorrectly on purpose. Yeah, and then he like he was teaching a class or something, and everyone laughed at the last one. Or they're all like, ah, you made a mistake or something. And he and he was like, you know, I'm paraphrasing. I'm, you know, kind of not doing it justice. But he's uh, he's like, it's interesting that everyone noticed the one mistake and not the ten other brilliant examples of of this problem. Ah. And that's we all, yeah, we all do that. Like, you know, someone makes one bad movie, and you're like, oh, that guy's the worst. You know, know. and you're forgetting about, you know, the ten other movies, you know, Al Pacino's made or or whoever. That's right. It's a sad comment on humanity. David Lee yeah. Roth. David Lee Roth had a great quote when it came to that. He said, mm. "Dare to stick your head above the crowd. Somebody's bound to throw a rock at it." Oof. True. He's got some good, good quotes. That guy. <laughs> what, a, what a life that guy's had, man. <laughs> no kidding. I, I really, I really love that guy. I remember I read his book Crazy from the Heat, and uh, what an interesting character that he chose. Um, you know, like right after his solo career, he became a paramedic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In New York, in New York City. Oh yeah, He's just just because. Led a just fascinating life. I recommend that book too. It was it was fantastic read. He's uh, he's yeah. a very very interesting guy, a lunatic. Very interesting, but a very a lunatic. interesting guy. An eccentric in every you know definition of the word. Yeah, definitely eccentric. Yeah. Now your next tune is one that mm -hmm. I do not know. It's Betty okay. Swan, and the song is called "Don't Touch Me." Yeah. So uh, another friend of mine that uh, he's passed away a couple of years ago, he was, um, his name is Brian Cover, okay. and uh, he, he invented his own style of guitar playing called double slide. He modified his lap steel to, and uh, he had these custom slides made for like his thumb and his ring finger so he could play double slide. Okay. And uh, he used to host Grossman's for those in the Toronto area, Grossman's Sunday Night Blues Jam for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. He ran that. And he toured with a bunch of people. He played with all the blues greats and, you know, he met everybody. And he was kind of like a mentor to me in terms of when I was coming up uh, in the, you know, playing the blues scene and stuff. Brian was always one of the older cats that always, be, he'd always have time for me. And he was nice. And like, and, and I get it being the older cat now, like when these young guys are coming in, you know, they're, they're playing, you're playing, you don't have time for them. You're doing your thing, they're doing their thing. And maybe it's not so much anymore because it is a different time. But back in the day, it was like, you know, set up, play, plug in, be good. If you're not, get off, you know, yeah, like that, you know, play your instrument. You can't play, get off the stage, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I, I totally respect that. That That is, you know, one of the ways to, to get good. But Brian would always take me aside after he had like, you know, some pointers for me. He's like, you might want to try this, you might want to try that. And, you know, I loved him for that. And as I got older, we kind of became like, I, I would never dare to say equals, but like peers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I joined him at his, he had a Thursday night in Kensington market. It was an acoustic night and I would bring my acoustic and I would just sit with him all night and play for hours on end. And then I would join him on Sundays at Grossman's and I'd sit with him and I'd host for him and he, as he was getting sick near the end of his life and I'd cover for him and stuff. 
Mm. Anyways, beautiful man. I just want to put that tribute out to him because uh, he's a, a legend in Toronto and, and and he should be in the world. A beautiful guitar player, singer, songwriter. And this song, he would always put it on and, it, and always I'd watch him like saunter and slow dance with himself or his wife. around. And he loved the song so much. And the more he played, I noticed how how gentle, like when you listen to the song, Betty has this way of singing that it sounds like she's um, overdubbing on the track mm. and she's not with the band in the room. She sounds really close to the mic and very soft. But this being the 50s, she's for sure in the room with the band. Mm -hmm. They didn't, you know, she's not in a vocal booth. So it's it's kind of magical how she made it sound like she, it sounds like there's a band and then she's in another room uh, or she overdubbed it at a later date, which does not seem plausible for the timeline. And she's just got this whispery singing voice. And when she says, don't touch me, it's so, so soft, but yet so powerful. And her vocal delivery is a really good lesson because she is a soul singer, but she's not a soul shouter, but she still conveys and, and twists with the same idiosyncrasies as other soul singers, but in this really soft way that almost like it lures you into her vocal. Mm -hmm. And of course, I don't know who the backing band is, but you know, they're a bunch of killers from, from that time, this late fifties, early sixties, everyone's top notch on it. And uh, she's one of those like lost in time uh, soul singers of which there were many. And I'm kind of really glad that Brian turned me on to her. Now she's one of my favorites. And luckily she's on, you know, your, your streaming services so you can go and listen to her. And she's like, I've never heard a track by her where she wasn't blown away. Wow. And uh, I, I love listening to her because she's kind of like a hidden treasure. I'm going to check that out. That's so cool. Please do. Yeah, yeah. Betty Swan. Yeah. Now, your next song is one of my absolute favorites. So oh, it should be every. should be everyone. Oh, it's a classic. So I don't know if you've heard the Leon Russell version of this. This of course, is, um, he wrote it. Yeah, in 1970, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's, your, your pick is Ray Charles. The song is called A Song For You. I, I, I picked the Ray Charles just because of the piano lick. And Ray does it justice. I was, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, you know? I was gonna, but he also and, uh, he also puts those Ray Charles kind of like piano lines in there towards the end. Oh my gosh! And you know what a singer. And uh, my other favorite version is Willie Nelson's. Yeah, that's on his Shotgun Willie song. And the reason why I chose this one is there is an, and I, I couldn't find it, which is why I just chose a Ray Charles one. There is a version that I watch once a year. It's only on YouTube because it was a video, and it's for Willie Nelson's birthday. I think it was his seventieth or seventy fifth birthday. I don't know if you remember, it was like a video tribute, like a, it was a concert, right? A concert tribute where people went up and they did like Willie Nelson songs, like, you know, Errol Smith and all these people like went up and did it. And there's one scene, I think it's near the end of the show. It, it, it chokes me up every time. So I watch it once a year just to like make sure my soul is alive, <laughs> you know, uh, just to make sure I'm still feeling feelings. And it always brings me to tears. And it's Leon Russell is on one side on a piano. Mm. Ray Charles is on the other side on the piano and they're facing each other on pianos and Willie is standing in the middle um, and he's just stoic and standing there. You know, he's not singing. He's just in between the two pianos with Leon Russell, the guy who wrote it, mm -hmm. sings the first verse, and then Ray Charles sings the rest of it oh, wow. and just, and just destroys it. And Willie's standing there in the middle, bawling his eyes out. No kidding. Wow, yeah, dude. So cool. if anyone's out there, just type in Willie Nelson, Ray Charles, a song for you, Leon Russell, it'll pop up. And just watch this performance. It's one of the great all-time songs, a song for you. It's such a classic. And uh, Donnie Hathaway's version is also amazing. Um, but that video version is definitely my all-time favorite. And it's Ray Charles in his later years. And he still sings and plays like like the legend that he is. And, and watching Willie trying to absorb this moment where these two, and also friends of his, mm -hmm. you know, these two geniuses are playing and playing the song to him a song they've all had hits with and it's for his birthday. It's such a heavy moment that it's just, it's so powerful that yeah. Song for you. And whoever's singing it, I think even Aretha has a killer version. Of it. She does. Yeah. And yeah. So, so after, yeah. after this, Whoever. Leon Russell put it out in 70 and in the five years, I think that followed, I think like eight people re-recorded it. Willie Ooh. Nelson, Aretha, the Carpenters did a version of it. Ray Charles, like it was just, you know, it's a, it's a classic. Yeah. It's one of those songs. Everyone just did it. Like, yeah. How powerful is that? Everyone just wants to cover this song. Like yesterday by the Beatles. Everyone right. just wanted to cover it. If in your life you could ever do something like that. Right. That's heavy. That, that cements Leon Russell into the annals of history for all time. 
easily. Yeah. Okay, this next one is new to me too. I've never heard it before. It's Maddie Leon, and the song is called Boy. So Maddie was just in my house a little while ago. He dropped off some donuts for my for my wife's uh, birthday that just passed. Nice. And Maddie is a is a Toronto Canadian uh, artist, and I, I play in his band. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I know it's kind of self serving to pick a song, but I, in my opinion, Maddie is one of the great songwriters in Canada. Just a phenomenal. Uh, we just recorded his new album with a producer named Mark Howard. For anybody that wants to do a quick Wikipedia search on Mark Howard, that guy has worked with, he's worked with Daniel Lanois since he was like 19. So you 2 Red Hot Chili Peppers, Willie Nelson, Bob Dylan, uh, Tom Waits, Neil Young, he's worked with everybody. And uh, we just made a record with him. So it was great to like sit around and shoot the fat and listen to stories but with Mark uh, of all these Robert plants, like Feist, all these people he's worked with wow. throughout time. Yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a great week. We went away for a week to a, to a cottage and set up and recorded uh like on location just woke up every day recorded and, and so a beautiful experience we just came back from making that record and i think it's one of his best records that he's ever made he, he's definitely made a classic so i played with maddie since about two, 2016 and up until that time like all of his stuff is, is stellar like uh quarterly harmonically rhythmically him and his brother mike are in the band his brother mike's the, the drummer i play bass in his band and sing backups and maddie plays guitar He's the principal songwriter to his band, his project. So up until then, they're all like these, you know, beautiful, beautifully written songs, but lyrically, they're generally, you know, like love songs, uh, you know, of one type or the other, brokenhearted, getting back together, you know, those kind of variations on a theme. And all solid, like nothing, not like, like you know, bad lyrics, all fantastic. But mm -hmm. this song kind of came out and it was like, a, a, it was like, you could hear he had just leveled up in his writing. And it's the story of a couple that have a child together and uh, unfortunately the the woman takes the child from from the from the the guy and you know she's trying to turn the child against him and he's trying to you know get joint custody and blah, blah blah and you know it took me a few listens to it to finally be like oh this is like stories in here you know because i i got so used to just listening to the beautiful lyrics and not really kind of like picking them apart right mm -hmm. and uh so i started picking this one up and i and it started like hitting really heavily i was like oh this is like a story going. like oh i can i can see how she's trying to take the boy and uh the boy away from this guy and then i found out it was a true story about a friend of his and i was oh. like oh man you you wrote like a classic song like, this is a friend of mine writing like these a-game lyrics like like i'm not good at song uh, uh, storytelling songwriting it's not my niche i like more like mick jagger rock and roll lyrics it's like some of them kind of make sense some of them are telling the story but they're kind of vague colorful you know that kind of style the song the storytelling kind of songwriting it's really difficult to do where there's a story going through it you know like eleanor rigby or something like whether yeah. it's real or not like there's a storyline going through that and maddie definitely has that song was the turning point for him and then subsequently he's done that on his, on his records and he's written brilliant songs of that style where there's like stories in there and like you can follow along and actually be like oh my god this is what happened there and boom, boom. in my opinion maddie's destined to be one of the greatest songwriters in Canada and, and not just saying that because a friend of mine I'm blessed to be able to play music with him and, uh, and to know him as a friend and everyone should check him out and this is Boy by Maddie Leon I will, I will do that cool all right, your last one is uh, it can't mm. really get any more old school country than this really it's Hank Williams and I'm so lonely I could cry oh man can you not feel the pain in this guy's <laughs> voice when you're hearing this? Oh, yeah. It's you. It's like you feel so bad for this guy. You're like, oh, oh my know. God. It's so, like, it's the other end of the, like, it's another way of, like, singing, like, soul singing. Like, it's the, it's the other side of the coin to me. It's like, with country singers, it's not as emotive vocally, but it is in terms of the, it's still in the delivery. It's just not vocal dynamics mm -hmm, exactly. you know it's a different it's a different way um but it's still the same kind of purity and direct message and then you find out how how hank williams died mm -hmm. alone in the back seat of a car on the road like in the middle of nowhere like literally of a broken heart he was so lonesome he died you know just drinking away his pain oh my god just heartbreaking story and you know like i i was gonna pick like you know uh a Merle Haggard tune or a George Jones tune. But then I was like, man, Hank is the archetype for all these dudes. Like, oh, yeah. It doesn't matter if it's Willie or Chris Christopherson or Johnny Cash. It's Hank. Yeah. Hank is, Hank is, Hank is the architect of all these 
you know, acts for the male singers anyways, you know, like the first great lyricist, you know, in country music, I think, you know, it's kind of like Chuck Berry was for rock and roll. Um, mm -hmm. He kind of like was the first to kind of put like, you know, not just like, uh, hey, girl, I love you. You love me kind of lyrics like, yeah. you know, riding along in my automobile. Oh, this is a story. Where are you going? You know, like Maybelline, why can't you be true? Like, what's this guy talking about? These are there's a story here. You know, so Hank was the first kind of person that did that for country music where there was like these stories. Because before that, it was like, you know, uh, like traditional songs like um, like the Carter family would sing and like, uh, yeah. you know, like more songs for everyone to sing. But this is like these were personal lyrics, They're songwriting from a personal perspective. I'm so lonesome. I could cry. That's right. You know, yeah, like it's heavy. It's a heavy thing. And and I also want to point out that uh, most people don't notice that. His other song, Move It On Over, which later became a hit for George Thorogood, mm -hmm. was ripped off by Bill Haley in the comics for Rock Around the Clock. Oh, interesting. He made the bad the house about quarter the dead. Move it on over. Oh, there you go. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. We're gonna rock, rock. Same song. Wow. No one no one even noticed Bill Haley ran away. But you know, kudos that's to Bill Haley. That's interesting, eh? You know, and, and at that time, I mean now. It's so much easier oh. for, for artists to rip off other artists because there's such a span of, of music. But back then, right. what was that, like 50, 60 years ago? You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> You'd think somebody would have picked up on that. Yeah. And, and for someone to get as popular as Hank was, like, or, or Ray Charles, or like another book to read is Brother Ray, Ray Charles' autobiography, man. Mm -hmm. What a life that guy. But, you know, like for those people to get as big as they were, like, people don't understand that, like, in the scope of that in the current landscape because like you know i'm on spotify you can listen to me in the ukraine or you can listen to me in in, in china it doesn't matter where you're if you can or maybe not china they have a different internet there yeah. but in japan and whatever like you can log on and check me out mm -hmm. right not that hard but for you to become a worldwide star like ray charles or hank williams or something like in that day and age that's hard oh, that yeah. was hard like how did you get how did people know who you were on the other side of the country that's right. How? Toured. Right now, someone wrote a, yeah, you toured. Someone maybe wrote a letter to their cousin that lived in California. Oh, I've heard of this person. Maybe he got played on the radio. Maybe someone other than like that state had that pick up that radio station and could hear you. It was really hard back then. So I have, you know, I don't want to be like, oh, I've stuck in the past. But like, you know, I, I just have a different, in that regard, I have a different respect for people that got really popular on the merits of their talents in that day and age because it was really difficult to to become as broad famously as they did i totally get it and i would venture to say that i actually hear that kind of ethos in your music as a matter of fact oh well yeah. I'm, I'm honored to be in the same company as those guys <laughs> and gals thank you thank you that you were thinking about it. telling you man middle of the night it's gonna be a huge hit <laughs> all right from your from your mouth to god's ears let's do it <laughs> All right, man. Listen, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. It was so great Thank to talk you. to you. Uh, hang on the Always. line. Hang on the line. I'm just going to close the show out and we'll finish up. Yes, sir. All right. All right. This has been No Sleep Till Subbury with Brent Jensen and my very special guest. Wait for it. Mr. Nelson Sobral. No, I didn't quite Ooh. get it there. Sobral. Love it. Getting better. <laughs> I can practice it. Until next time, folks. Take good care. Brent Jensen is the best-selling author of No Sleep Till Subbury, Leftover People, and All My Favorite People Are Broken. All titles available in stores and on Amazon Worldwide.